We're back with another episode of Who's Your Mets and Legends. I'm Rebecca Wilhelm. I'm Mary Quigley. And I'm Hope Wilhelm. Join us as we dive into the spookier side of the Hoosier State. So what comes to your mind when you think of Indiana? Do you think of corn? Do you think of basketball? Do you think of the Indianapolis 500? Maybe you think of famous celebrities who were born in Indiana, like John Mellencamp or Michael Jackson. But as the saying goes, there was more than corn in Indiana. 92 counties make up the Hoosier State. In this podcast, we are going to discuss some Indiana folklore from each of these counties. If you are into tall tales, ghosts, or spooky legends, then this is a podcast you are not going to want to miss. Today, we bring you a story from Indianapolis's most protected and historic district. We will discuss a home located in the Irvington neighborhood in Marion County, Indiana. In August of 2001, Pepper Parton and Wendy Geringer moved into what they believed would be the perfect starter home at 5811 Julian Avenue in the Indianapolis-Irvington neighborhood. The two ladies could not have even imagined what would happen once they moved into the Victorian-era cottage. According to a 2011 Indy Star article, Shortly after moving in, the ladies began experiencing odd things, such as doors slamming, drawers opening, lights flickering, glass shattering, disembodied male voices saying things like, ask her, or was it Oscar, and come walk with me. They quickly realized something was off with their newly purchased home. One evening, the ladies realized their home was part of a ghost tour, when they looked out of a window to find around 100 people on their lawn taking photos. Sit back, relax, turn the lights down low, and get comfortable as we bring you a tale of the Indianapolis Murder House and its ties to H.H. H. Holmes, America's first serial killer. <laughs> I cannot imagine finding out that your home is part of a ghost tour. Me either. It makes me think of when we took the haunted tour of Alton, Illinois in June, and we went to the old TB hospital. Yeah, that was sure wild, standing out there hearing about the ghost stories as people came home from work or they were in their home cooking dinner. Yeah, I guess after a while, you would get used to it. I can't imagine what Pepper Parton and Wendy Geringer thought when they saw all of those people out in their yard. Well, they also had no idea that their home was connected to America's first serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes, and the mysterious disappearance and death of a 10-year-old boy named Howard Pitzel. The only thing they knew for sure was that they had both started experiencing weird things in their home after moving in. As we mentioned in our opening, the ladies had both experienced what we would refer to as your classic haunting activity, Things such as doors slamming, drawers opening, lights flickering, and glass shattering. The most disturbing thing would be the disembodied male voices. The couple even sought therapy, only to have a therapist tell them that they did not need to do therapy. They instead were advised to find a psychic to help them with their home. Things started to come together in 2003 when the book Devil in the White City by Eric Larson was published. Side note. This is a great read, so if you've not read it yet, put it on your to-read list. The book details H.H. Holmes' crimes and his connection with Wendy and Pepper's home. It also caused the ladies to realize why their home was a popular spot on the ghost tour. In October of 1894, Holmes rented the house from J.C. Wands in Indianapolis, paying one month's rent in advance according to the Road Trippers website. 
Holmes is infamous for his murder castle in Chicago. His real name was Herman Webster Mudgett, and he is believed to have murdered at least 200 people, maybe even more. Now, most of his murders did occur in Chicago, but he was known to have committed a few murders in other states, Indiana being one of them. In October of 1894, Holmes was acting as the guardian of eight-year-old Howard Pitzel and of his sisters, Alice and Nellie. Little Howard, Alice, and Nellie were the children of Benjamin Pitzel, who had been Holmes's partner in crime. Holmes had killed Benjamin in Philadelphia and planned to kill the remaining members of the Pitzel family. Holmes wanted to keep the secrets of his many crimes from coming to light. It is thought that on the afternoon of October the 10th, 1894, Holmes drugged little Howard with cyanide of potassium first and then suffocated him. Pitzel's death was also the first murder to occur in Irvington. He hid his body, however, in a horrific manner. That afternoon, he had a wooden stove delivered to the home. It was in this stove that he decided to burn the body of Howard Pitzel. Once the body was burned, Holmes spread the ashes of little Howard around the outside of the home. Alice and Nellie were staying in the Circle House Hotel on Monument Circle. Holmes took the girls to Toronto, where he murdered them on October the 25th, 1894. It would take authorities a year before teeth, jawbone fragments, and the stomach of Howard Pitzel would be found in the wood stove on Julian Street. They also recovered his feet in the cellar. Holmes maintained during the trial that he had not killed Howard and instead had left him in the care of Hatch and Minnie Williams on October 10th, and that that had been the last time he had been seen. We will be back with some other strange things we uncovered about H.H. Holmes after a short break. Hey listeners, in case you didn't know, we wrote a book. Haunted Dearborn County, Indiana is now available at all major retailers. Strange and unusual things lurk behind the calm facade of Dearborn County. Several legends surround the Hill Forest Mansion, the home of one of Aurora's founding families. Many have seen the ghost of a farmer and his mule at Carnegie Hall in Morse Hill. The glowing grave at Riverview Cemetery may connect to the 1941 Agru family massacre. St. Mary's Church Rectory is said to be haunted by the former priest. And the spirits at Whiskey's in Lawrenceburg are not just in the drinks. Several schools in the area echo with the sounds of former students and staff, and numerous local residences house the spirits of former owners who have never left. Join Rebecca and I on a chilling tour from Lawrenceburg to Lawrenceville and beyond. Check out HoosierMissingLegends.com for more details. Before renting this home in Indianapolis, H.H. Holmes was terrorizing Chicago during the World's Fair of 1893. Holmes had constructed what has come to be known as the Murder Castle. It was a hotel for guests of the World's Fair. The castle, which was located at 63rd and Wallace, had soundproof rooms, makeshift gas chambers, and a basement, where Holmes would dissect and strip bodies of unsuspecting guests down to skeletons, and then he was selling these to medical schools. Yes, during this time, it was common for dead bodies to be sold to medical schools. Holmes would also collect life insurance on his victims. He would befriend some and take out policies and then off them, collecting the money. You know, that's just really disturbing to me. I know that it used to be very easy to take a policy out on basically anyone you wanted to. And while Mary and I were researching for this story about the Irvington house, we uncovered a pretty crazy link between H.H. Holmes and Jack the Ripper. The great-great-grandson of Holmes, Jeff Mudgett, believes that his ancestor may be the monster responsible for the Whitechapel London murders that happened between 1888 to 1891. In an article titled H.H. Holmes' Great-Great-Grandson Investigates His Ancestor's Bloody Legacy by Brianna Cooper, Holmes' Great-Great-Grandson's theory is explained. There is also a great YouTube video of a TED Talk that Jeff Mudgett gave in Vancouver about his theory that Holmes and Jack the Ripper are one and the same. We will attach the link to that video. It's a great video. If you get the chance, you may want to watch it. 
Apparently, he had no idea about his infamous ancestor. And the more research he did, the more connections he made between the Jack the Ripper case and Holmes murders. And things were just way too similar. One of the biggest red flags for Mudgett was that several of the victims had organs removed, and this was something that Holmes did as well. Holmes was well known for dissecting his victims and selling their organs and skeletons to medical schools. Another crazy similarity involves the last known Ripper victim, Mary Jane Kelly. Kelly was the only victim who was murdered inside a building. Her murder and the horrible injuries done to her body are also similar to things done by Holmes during his murder castle killings in the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Being indoors allowed the killer to do things he wanted to do to the body without anyone seeing what was going on. Something even more striking is mentioned in Barbara Cooper's article, and it's pointed out that there's no documentation of Holmes being in the United States during the period of Jack the Ripper. There is also documentation of an H. Holmes who was on a ship between Liverpool and New York during this time period. It was listed in the passenger lists. Cooper's article mentions that this is what would be considered circumstantial evidence, but it still seems likely that Holmes might have been in England during this time period. The last piece of evidence that seems to really tie Holmes as being the Jack the Ripper involves the famous Dear Boss letter that was sent to the Central News Agency of London on September 25th, 1888. It was also sent to Scotland Yard on September 29th, 1888. The Dear Boss letter was two pages in length, and it's full of spelling and grammatical errors, and we're going to read the letter for you listeners. Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they'd look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. I am down on horse, and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work that last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope, yeah. Ha ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for the jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work. Then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade name. P.S. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands, curse it. No luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now. Ha ha. This letter is just wild. What's even stranger is that according to Jeff Mudgett, the handwriting is similar to that of H.H. Holmes. The University of Buffalo apparently ran the letter and writings known to be written by Holmes through the same computer system that the FBI and the CIA used to match handwriting, and it was a very high match. And that's just creepy. And one of the comments that I've seen, not only in Cooper's article, but other places online, is that the letter gives the feeling of being written by an American that's just trying to imitate somebody who's British. That's exactly the way Cooper explains it in the article, and I have to agree. I think it definitely seems odd. There is something not right about that letter. Barbara Cooper's article points out what I think might be the most convincing piece of evidence linking Holmes to Jack the Ripper. Apparently, when they were filming in Irvington for the show American Ripper, they excavated the ground and around the house at 5811 Julian Avenue. While this was going on, a local historian named Alan Hunter came forward with a box that was left behind after the murder of Howard Pitzel. Mary is going to read from Cooper's article. In the box were a set of English-made surgical tools, Holmes' commencement program from his graduation from the University of Michigan, a photograph of Pat Quinlan, an assistant to Holmes in the murder castle, and a tin-type photograph of Elizabeth Stride, the third victim of Jack the Ripper. Now, does any of this exactly 100% prove Jack the Ripper was H.H. H. Holmes? I mean... 
I think it makes a strong possibility. I agree. I hope one day the truth comes out. I know this was a very long time ago, but I still think it matters. For me, I think the creepiest thought of all is that the same man who terrorized the Chicago World's Fair building his murder castle could also be the infamous Jack the Ripper. That he has an Indiana connection is just wild to me. Holmes referred to himself as a devil during his trial, and he actually admitted to the jury that he had the devil within himself. In 1894, the devil came to the Hoosier State. Jeff Mudgett is the author of a book called Bloodstains, which covers his search for the truth about his ancestor. I have not read this yet, but I know that I'm going to be putting this on my to-read list for sure. There is so much more out there that we just can't cover in one episode. There is also apparently some suspicion that Holmes may have faked his own death and escaped execution in 1896. Apparently, there have been some discrepancies involving DNA, the documentation of how Holmes's corpse looked and his skeleton. So Mudgett does not believe that it's actually H.H. H. Holmes who was executed. And we may have to visit this killer again. As unfortunately, Holmes did murder others in Indiana. Uh, there was two victims discovered in a home in Lowell, Indiana in 1919. There is also some proof that the home at 5811 is not the exact same house and that it was either torn down or moved around the block. Have you ever had an experience with the paranormal in the 5800 block of Julian Avenue in Indianapolis? Are you familiar with the legends of H.H. H. Holmes? We would love to hear about it. Please send us an email to who's your miss and legends at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media. We may use it in a later episode. In the email, let us know if you wish to remain anonymous. see our source material, please visit our website, hoosiermissandlegends.com. Please find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and now Twitter. Hoosier Miss and Legends is a Quigley Productions podcast. Our theme song was written and recorded by Wet Blanket. The song title is Taxidermy Race Car. As always, stay spooky.